I'm a professor of political science, um, but I work in a school of international studies, uh, University of Denver. Um, I have uh, been several other institutions, including GW for a very long time um, and University of California, Irvine. Um, I've, I work on security studies, but I was sort of a um, reluctant security scholar. I really got into security studies because of um, a concern with certain problems. So I don't feel like I'm, I've been kind of inculcated into the security mindset. Um, that said, I, I, um, I got my degree right when security became very debated in the field. And I think um, that debate has been really fruitful um, for my work um, as well as for others' work. Um, and so probably the thing I'm most proud of that I've done in the field is actually start a journal um, called the Journal of Global Security Studies that is um, precisely aimed to get people who think about security in different ways to interact. The security studies field um, has traditionally, um, it, well, it started actually as a field, um, partly in response to people in international relations, sorry, <clears throat> people in international relations um, that study the economy sort of breaking away in order to have their own space. Because during the Cold War, a lot of the um, the, the oxygen in the room was taken by people studying the really important things, which were was the nuclear exchange or potential for one um, with the Soviet Union. And so as people in international political economy kind of broke away to create their own space, um, security scholars then said, well, we want our own space too. And they started, um, um, you know, the journal International Security and, um, and, and, you know, a way of sort of thinking about international politics that was rooted in particular kinds of assumptions um, that nation states were sort of the primary entities and the most important ones, um, and that, that issues having to do with violence were critical, um, but also that a lot of the issues having to do with violence were really about how to use them effectively to make sure that if there was a conflict, you would win it. Um, which is a really different kind of enterprise than people studying, for instance, peace and conflict, where the primary concern is about mitigating violence or sort of reducing the possibility for violence. Um, and so, the, you know, those two um, uh, perspectives on violence were sort of vying for attention, um, I would say, during the Cold War. Um, as the Cold War ended, um, there was a sort of blossoming of arguments about what are we really worried about when we talk about security? Are we really worried about whether the planet will survive um, in, in terms of climate change? Are we really worried about the, you know, the personal violence that we might experience? Or are we really worried about, you know, Mexico invading or, you know, the, the, the you know, some sort of rising contender um, uh, in global politics? And that began what I thought was a really productive conversation about that how you think about these different things really have very different implications for how, how you study. And um, so there's a big debate. Um, the debate didn't really resolve itself as most debates don't. Um, and instead there were just a lot of communities saying, well, we agree to study it this way and therefore we're gonna talk to each other. But what I found really interesting is that how you think about security in one way can affect how it manifests in a different way. For instance, thinking about issues having to do with very personal things like domestic violence can actually be important for thinking about how institutions in society like police forces or military forces behave in ways that might actually matter for how they fight. Um, and so there's connections between these kind of more national security and sort of traditional perspectives about managing violence effectively so you win and these much more individualistic and sociological concerns. And th so the, the Journal of Global Security Studies was launched in order to facilitate conversations between those different conceptions of security and um, different 
ways of sort of even thinking about what is security, what makes you feel secure um, in ways that um, might illustrate those connections and, and build some sort of useful conversation um, that would help us make progress on all these different concerns about security. So, um, you know, when I'm like writing keywords about what I do, I often talk about the fact that I, that I study non-state actors in global politics. And, you know, non-state actors is a really weird term defined by what it's not. Um, and um, and I, I think that the, the issue of non-state actors is um, looking at all of those authorities um, that have implications for global politics, but are not necessarily governments. And there's a lot of different types and um, the type matters. Um, and it matters, uh, it, part of the way I began going about studying these different types was sort of implicitly paying attention to why do we even care about them? Like, why are they important to global politics? Why does anybody pay attention to them to begin with? Um, and um, as, as is often the case with the way I think, this kind of intuition about, well, in order to study these, we should pay first attention to why people pay attention to them to begin with, became sort of the basis for for an argument about sort of what makes these actors authoritative. And so, um, so when I'm thinking about, for instance, companies or NGOs, um, I look first at like, what is it? What, you know, what makes these a group and why do people pay attention to them? Um, and so, so this, this mechanism of like, why you pay attention to them, why do you defer to these actors in the first place or their kind of basis of authority is really the sort of basic insight that I use in sort of thinking about these different actors. Um, the second thing is that, that part of the reason um, I started studying them in the first place is that even though government to government interactions are critically important in global politics. They're not the only things that are important. Um, you know, big companies like Facebook and Twitter are hugely con consequential for what we do. And so um, that actually plays out in thinking about the way these actors influence global politics, because it's rarely that one influences it all by themselves. Um, so these actors often interface with others. And so their relationships are not only with their constituents, those that defer to them, um, who they claim authority to, um, but also um, with each other. And so the, the, you know, the two key mechanisms that I pay attention to when I'm looking at um, non-state actors is who are they? Why do people defer to them to begin with? What kinds of claims do authority, to authority do they make? And then what are their relationships with other authorities, particularly um, in particular issue spaces? So maybe I'll start um, by, by talking about, uh, you know, how I got into studying non-state actors. Um, which was, um, I wrote my dissertation on um, uh, military interventions in um, sort of proxy wars or um, sort of less than major power wars. And um, uh, ironically, I'll never forget John Ruggie telling me at my, um, when I defended my prospectus, it's really sad because you're making such an interesting theoretical argument and nobody will ever read this because everyone cares about what's going on between the US and the Soviet Union. But uh, I finished my dissertation right at the end of the Cold War. And um, there were all these kind of peace missions where actually the kinds of things that I studied um, in military interventions were, were, were important. So people actually cared about my work much more than I thought. Um, as I went to all these conferences um, about uh, the peace missions in the 1990s, I started running into people who were representing different companies, um, one of which was Brown and Root, which became Kella, Kella Brown and Root, which became Halliburton, um, which we've all heard about now. 
Um, and I was curious about why they were there. Um, and so I talked to them every time and they would talk about their work in Somalia or in Bosnia. And um, it was clear to me that what they were doing, even though there was some of this kind of work um, that I had noted when I was doing research on the US um, intervention in Vietnam, that what they were doing these peace, peace missions was actually bigger and more important to the mission um, than I had, um, than, than I would have thought. Um, and so I started just keeping a file. Um, and by the time um, I got tenure, the file was really thick. And um, when you get tenure, it's an awesome moment to like just branch out into something completely new and different. <laughs> and so I decided to do that. Um, and so I just started like learning everything I could about all of the different companies that were involved in violent enterprises around the world. And I also started reading really broadly, um, including work on privatization, which tends to be much more domestically focused, looking at, you know, trash collection and, um, you know, water provision and things like that. But the privatization literature alerted me to this distinction between um, companies or private actors that are delivering security services and those that are kind of authorizing services or financing them. And so that became the sort of structure for um, how I thought about private security. Um, and so um, I wrote a book in 2005 um, called The Market for Force, where I look not only at the private delivery of security services, but also um, companies um, like Shell um, in Nigeria that were authorizing or paying for security services. Also NGOs like World Wildlife Fund that was actually paying for security services um, in a park in the Democratic Republic of Congo where the last of the world's not Northern white, white rhinos lived. Um, and then also even humanitarian NGOs that um, financed or contemplated hiring companies. Um, they didn't end up hiring companies, but they did um, authorize security um, in the Goma camps. Um, uh, following the Rwanda genocide. Um, and so my entree into um, studying non-state actors was really studying them in a place where you would least expect them to have influence on you know, actual use of force um, and studying some pretty unusual bedfellows, including you know, huge oil companies or mining companies, but alongside um, civil society organizations, NGOs, some of them providing um, services on the ground, others advocating for human rights and other kinds of um, uh, sort of principled causes. Um, and, then, um, and then the companies that, that they sometimes interacted with who provided services for them. So when I first studied, started studying private military and security services, you know, they were doing a lot of things that people don't really pay attention to. Um, you know, uh, I mean, famous, um, uh, you know, military strategists uh, talk about the fact that, you know, what really matters for military strategy is logistics. But, you know, most people don't even think about logistics. They might not even know what it is. Um, and, and a lot of what these companies were providing was food, um, uh, tr transport of goods, um, laundry services, like when you're fighting a war all day, you need clean socks in the morning, you know, and they would do a lot of that kind of thing. They also did a lot of training. Um, um, a lot of the interactions that you, the U.S. has with other forces around the world are training enterprises. And these were um, uh, enterprises that as the US military became stretched in the 1990s, they found easy to contract out to these, um, to these private companies. So a lot of my cases in this 2005 book were looking at you know, these mundane things that people really don't pay attention to. But um, when the Iraq war started um, and there, it turned out that U.S. forces weren't always met with candy and flowers, um, and the the war turned out to be much more. Um, uh, it, it was a more, much more difficult environment than U.S. forces had expected, um, 
And yet it was kind of politically fraught. So the idea that you mobilize, you know, uh, 30,000, 100,000 more troops and send them to Iraq was not something that George W. Bush wanted to even think about. Um, the fact that these companies existed provided an avenue for sort of dealing with particular concerns like getting people from a, place A to place B um, in ways that didn't require sending a bunch of forces over there. And so even though there was nobody who made some grand strategic decision in Iraq to privatize the war, that's essentially what happened um, kind of in increments. So basically, um, as the sort of statue of Saddam Hussein fell and yet violence went up rather than down, there was this huge insurge, um, somewhere between 30 and 100,000 people um, into Iraq, um, all via contract. Um, and these are just the people that were working for the US government, by the way, because as the US um, began to sort of use contracts to solve particular problems like um, personal security or site security, um, they also turned to others that were operating in Iraq, including big oil companies, and said, you know what? If you're worried about security, you're responsible for it. So yeah, we're fighting the bad guys, but if you're really worried about what's happening in your oil facility, you need to hire your own security. And so everybody who went to Iraq um, between 2004 and 2008 Every single person, um, every sin single entity had some sort of security detail from ABC News to CARE to, um, you know, uh, different oil magnates. And so um, unsurprisingly, if you, you know, insert that level of um, people into a situation um, providing security, issues will arise, um, and they did. And so I think, you know, the Nisor Square shooting in 2007 was probably the most dramatic, um, but there were many others before that um, where private companies got involved in, um, you know, actual shooting incidents with others. Um, and all of a sudden, um, uh, people in the US began to pay attention. Status of forces agreements are agreements between countries um, where one country's forces are accorded certain rights and privileges. And they're really important because they, you know, decide all kinds of things about, you know, if somebody misbehaves, what happens um, and, and, and what's allowed um, for these forces to do in, um, in a country that is not their own. Um, the U.S. often accords similar kinds of privileges to contractors as it does its own troops. Um, and that's partly because, um, you know, as the U.S. has become to come to rely more and more on contractors, they simply can't have them taken, you know, out of commission because of some petty crime. And so, you know, part of the, 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 the issue is that the U.S. has a particular um, way of sort of thinking about um, uh, how they create order among their forces and they want sort of contractors to be included among those. That's not such a big deal when you're talking about logistics and training, um, although there were complexities with that too um, in the 1990s, but it came, became a much bigger issue in, um, in Iraq and Afghanistan because so many of the um, uh, contractors were actually providing services where they carried a gun and they were interacting with people. These kinds of security services put them in situations where they could be charged with murder, essentially, um, if, if there were not a status of forces agreement. And then the other complexity is that the, while the US may be able to deal fairly well with contractors that produce, you know, um, execute petty crimes in um, certain situations, they actually don't have a very good legal, legal framework for dealing with extraterritorial um, transgressions that you know, would amount to murder or something like that. And so the legal implications of the status of forces negotiations um, were, were, um, were much more complicated in Iraq and Afghanistan than they had been before.
private military and security companies are sort of defined by the sort of the services that they provide, um, but they come at these services from really different perspectives. Um, and um, there, there's actually been a very um, important, I think, um, uh, set of activities um, to develop a, a code of conduct for these um, companies that is that that puts them in accordance with international humanitarian law, you know, basic laws of war, um, so that if they're present in conflict situations, that they are respecting um, civilian space, that they are not shooting who they shouldn't shoot, um, and um, and that they're generally courting themselves in a way that. Um, uh, that that countries around the world might agree was was appropriate, um, but part of the reason that you use these companies to begin with is because they're a little more flexible than military forces, and that very flexibility opens up the possibility that they can be used for much more nefarious things. And when they are, um, they might um, not abide by anything like an international code of conduct. Um, and what's interesting, um, so Eric Prince um, started a company called Blackwater. Um, Blackwater has now been renamed. It's completely um, transformed. Eric Prince no longer works there, um, but he has continued to um, pursue a way of thinking about these companies um, that they are a tool for pursuing US interests um, in the most flexible way possible. And so there, you know, he um, would make the argument as early as the early 2000s that, um, that we ought not really think about these companies as part of international humanitarian law. We should think about them as tools for pursuing US power in the world. And um, that, um, that strategy is not unique to Eric Prince. I think if you look at the activities of the Wagner Group right now um, for Putin's government in Russia, you see a very similar kind of perspective where instead of you know, coming into the, you know, what we look at as sort of the governed space of um, security and conflict, um, which is governed by international humanitarian law and some human rights law, um, these are um, uh, activities that really are about power politics in its kind of rawest form. Um, and um, Eric Prince has always made the argument that what's really important is who you're fighting for, not how you're fighting. And so he wanted to pursue US interests. I think the Wagner Group um, has, has a similar kind of strategy for perhaps a little bit different reasons, um, but is very much about um, enhancing Putin's power and the power of his cronies um, uh, on the global stage um, and making money while they're doing it, which by the way, Eric Prince also has, um, he has a bear, you know, he's a nose for, um, for very profitable um, activities that um, might be a little bit on the edge of what we think of as legitimate, but he looks at legitimacy less in terms of what you're doing and more in terms of who you're doing it for. In the middle of the Iraq war, um, everybody was worried about private security. Um, it, it, it looked like it was, uh, it, it, you know, it, even though there was no policy decision to sort of privatize security in Iraq, um, all of these little decisions looked like smart ways to quickly get people into the field and solve a problem. But once they all got there and some of them had guns, um, there were incidents and the incidents were embarrassing to the US government. So they saw it as a problem, mostly of embarrassment. Um, they killed civilians. Um, so civilians saw it as a problem um, because they got killed. Um, they also disrupted military operations because it was very hard to know where they were and when they were gonna pop up. And so um, some of the, um, you know, careful attempts at counterinsurgency were disrupted by private sector actors um, acting in ways that they um, uh, that, that were not in accordance with what the troops were trying to do with counterinsurgency. Um, so uh, I'll never forget, um, Claude Volet from the ICRC came to my office at GW and asked like, what can we do? That we have to be able to do something. This is a disaster. 
And I was a very good political scientist. Um, and I told him why nothing would work. I basically, he went through all of these different options. And I basically, that will never work because the US interests are configured this way. This will never work because the money is that way. This will never work because we can't get coordination. So I basically used all my political science chops to tell him that nothing was gonna work. And we were basically screwed. Um, and I'll never forget, we, we both like stopped and there was a plane um, flying and my office was um, looked over the Washington Monument and this plane flying along. And, you know, it was kind of weird to look at planes in the sky still um, at that moment, 2005. And we were just like silent, um, kind of depressed. Um, Claude Belay did not listen to my advice. Um, and he basically, along with uh, the Swiss government, held a meeting. And the meeting was of stakeholders. Um, what is a stakeholder? It's anybody who is affected by or can affect a problem. And so in this meeting, he had company officials. Um, he had government officials um, interested in private security, company officials from, um, from uh, private security companies also clients of um, private security. So we also had oil companies present, NGOs that had hired them. Um, because it was the Swiss government and the ICRC, they probably had an over-representation of human rights NGOs. And they basically, in this meeting, which was really um, a fraught meeting, um, many people in the NGO community actually threatened to leave at several points during the meeting. Um, people were not they didn't like each other. They were calling each other names. It was a very controversial um, a setting. But in this meeting, um, people eventually, through a series of working groups, um, came up with a definition of private security. And they also decided that how governments interact with private security companies depends. Like sometimes governments are clients of private security companies. Other times private security companies are actually operating in government space. And sometimes governments are exporters of these kinds of services. And so there was this idea that maybe we need to explore these differences and that we had a definition. And so even though the meeting was really fraught, people went away um, feeling like, the, it sort of made progress because it had these couple of things. And then it not only made progress, but it also, um, uh, these different relationships that governments had with private security companies provided a structure for sort of thinking about the next meeting. And so basically they sent people away to think about these th three different relationships. And um, when they came back, um, there was a, a set of meetings kind of around this, all of which became much more collegial and, um, and agreed upon that ended up in something called the Montreux document. And the Montreux document is not actually a private sector um, uh, enterprise at all. It's a government to government document signed by, you know, there was 63 governments, now there's um, nearly 200, I think, um, that, uh, that essentially specify what international humanitarian law says about these three different relationships that governments have with private security companies. So it specifies, it kind of translates international humanitarian law into the responsibilities that governments have with respect to private security companies. At the end of the Montreux document, they decided that one of the things that they couldn't do with existing international humanitarian law was actually come up with a standard by which companies should behave. And so they launched another multi-stakeholder initiative to come up with an international code of conduct for companies, which they did. Um, it, is a, um, it is a standard that is agreed upon by governments, by civil society groups and by private security companies. So the international code of conduct charter actually has all kinds of different entities involved in it. Um, and then both the Montreux document and the International Code of Conduct have been written into international standards um, and American standards, um, as well as other government um, country standards um, that can be sort of written into contracts. So 
the sort of governance complex that has emerged around private security um, does involve governments, but it also involves companies and civil society groups. And it's, it's enunciated in this very, these various different kinds of um, agreements um, and they serve different purposes. Some of them just sort of lay out the principles. Others of them are, you know, uh, bring those principles into vehicles that can be used in contract law. And so they, they become sort of part of an enforcement mechanism. So um, I think a lot of times when we think about international order, we think about it as, you know, it's a piece like that, you know, people decide at Bretton Woods, all of these principles of economic order, and then, you know, it gets lodged into place and then they go out and, and, um, and, and essentially implement them. Um, but international order is actually always being um, created and recreated as we practice them. So the Bretton Woods institutions, for instance, you know, changed a lot over the course of time. Um, and um, a lot of what we think about international order based on kind of our images during the Cold War are orders that are created by governments. But a lot of the practicing of these orders um, is actually done by people who are acting in roles that are not governmental roles. They may be acting as companies pursuing profits or trying to find new markets. Um, they may be, you know, uh, in, uh, civil society organizations trying to advocate for certain principles or trying to um, provide certain services on the ground. And so, um, you know, Beginning, um, actually, stakeholder, multi-stakeholder ideas go back um, uh, to the 70s and 80s, but really began to take hold in the 1990s, partly because it was so important. It turned out that if you were trying to sort of deal with situation in the Niger Delta, Delta in Nigeria, that if you only had government forces at the table, you were not going to actually be able to affect, um, uh, you know, mitigating violence in that region, because oil companies were such a big part of things. And so were different um, activist organizations that were pushing for rights um, for people that were living in those areas. And so this idea of pulling in all the kind of relevant players is, is basically the idea of multi-stakeholderism and it is most important in my view for coming to sort of new ideas about order, the way it's actually being practiced now, as opposed to the way it was inculcated in an agreement 10 years ago. And so multi-stakeholderism is often a, a mechanism for kind of updating um, in a continual way or, uh, or at a particular point in time, um, uh, international order. Um, there's, there's actually a lot of work um, that people have begun to do to sort of look at whether multi-stakeholderism really works. Um, and a project at Harvard actually has just come out with a report saying, no, it doesn't work because it doesn't actually, it, it can't enforce in a quote unquote hard law way. And in my view, that really misunderstands what multi-stakeholderism is about because it really is about those moments when hard law is unclear and when the people who actually have the power to influence um, uh, events on the ground are not necessarily part of that hard law agreement and how to bring them in or sort of shift things in a way that you can get either a, a resurrection of order or a new kind of order. And so multi-stakeholderism often is, is a mechanism for actually kind of bringing people on board and for reflecting on and updating um, ideas about, you know, how we can um, manage ourselves collectively. So I have um, a new book manuscript um, that is, um, Looking, it's tentatively titled Global Public Action, but that probably will change. And um, the idea is um, actually it goes back to something um, 
that we talked a little about a little bit earlier, um, Dan, when you were talking about private authority. And I think I kind of take issue with the idea of private authority in a way, um, because I think about public and private more in terms of the orientation toward collective concerns versus more individual or subgroup concerns. And um, so in this book, what I'm looking at is, is how you get kind of an orchestration um, and, and uh, not in a technical way, but how you, how you get people sort of moving on the same page in different issue areas. Um, and I'm looking at um, climate, um, looking particularly at how the, the, the US pull out of Kyoto, which created this huge disaster, many people thought, didn't lead to you know, a, a complete negating of um, climate governance, but actually a lot of innovations and a new model of climate governance with the Paris um, Accord. Um, or the Paris Agreement. And then um, I'm also looking at sort of the wide range of um, uh, uh, issues that connect business security and human rights. So everything from the voluntary principles on security and human rights to the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Um, and then that includes the international code of conduct. So how this whole web of, of issues came together. And the third is on um, cybersecurity and internet governance. Um, and, and so those are the sort of three areas that I've begun to sort of look at these initiatives in. And I think that, um, I think that, Something um, again that you said, Dan, is really important to pay attention to is that governance is less about one thing and much more about how a lot of different things either work together in reinforcing ways that sort of create more kind of predictability and um, concert among um, the relevant actors versus those that kind of undermine each other and um, maybe create fissures, um, opportunities for sometimes productive change, but also for um, uh, much less productive um, or sort of violent enterprises. And so, um, so when I think about um, governance initiatives like multi-stakeholderism, I'm often not looking at it as a form in itself, by itself, but how it interacts um, with others. And one of the things that is the most useful, I think about the International Code of Conduct, is that it has fit so well with a wide variety of other multi-stakeholder initiatives, but also um, with government law. Um, and it's kind of this knitting together of the web that I think creates um, effective governance. So power is one of the most interesting and important um, things that I've struggled with, I guess, in sort of thinking about this. Um, and, and partly because um, a lot of, uh, of my work has demonstrated the quote unquote power of people that you wouldn't think of as powerful. Um, and sometimes their power is because people trust them um, and will kind of defer to them to make a suggestion that will be in all of their interests. Um, sometimes it's because people know a lot and they can articulate things in a way that sort of is meaningful to a wide variety of people. And those are not mechanisms of power that we often study in global politics. Um, you know, when we study power, we're often thinking about like military forces going in. Um, and so, um, so, but military forces going in are also really critical elements of power. Um, and, and so one of the things that I think is important is just to think about the different manifestations of power um, and, and the way in which power can be zero sum and it can be very confrontational, um, but power also can be very sort of under the rug um, in, in ways that you might not notice and can be sometimes exercised very effectively by people that you think are not powerful. Um, and, um, you know, like the ICRC uh, official who, who basically orchestrated a meeting, um, ended up getting, you know, in my view, 
a, a set of interactions that caused the U.S. to reimagine its interests in the global um, sphere with respect to private security companies. Um, so hugely powerful, um, but did it in such a quiet way. Um, and so I think that um, one of the, the, the sort of critical elements um, that, that I think deserves much more attention is sort of thinking about these different manifestations of power and also how they interact. Um, just like I was talking about a while ago about um, the different um, conceptions of security interacting. So how you think about human security might actually matter for national security in a certain situation. I also think that that's true with power. Um, if you use power in a very confrontational or zero sum way, you may actually undermine your quieter power. And I think we've seen that a lot actually with the Trump administration where this bombastic assertion of a very raw kind of power has undercut many of the ways that the US exercises influence in the world. And so I think a more sort of productive understanding about, um, about the way these different dimensions of power interact could actually be really useful um, you know, for academics, but also for, for policymakers and for people in the world who are trying to decide who can sort of best, um, uh, you know, um, uh, represent them um, on the global stage.